Welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. This is actually our first Grand Rounds in the series, but oddly intersects with our education Grand Rounds in terms of with an education theme. So this is a kind of bridge, uh, bridge Grand Rounds. We'll have a few education programs um, during the year. Later in the year, we'll talk about our fellowships and medical student training. Uh, in October, we'll talk about that. But today, we're spending some time um, talking a bit more about the residency training program. And we are very fortunate to have a few of our leaders with us today. So uh, let me let me tell you who is here. Um, faces that we all know well. This is um, a warm welcome for Dr. Christina Sauer, who's board certified general and child and adolescent psychiatrist and an associate professor here at UNM. Dr. Sauer completed medical school at the University of Colorado and residency and fellowship training here at UNM. She is currently our general residency training uh, program director and has been involved with many educational pursuits during her time as faculty and is uh, in charge of uh, wellness initiatives for uh, all of the residency training uh, residents in our organization. We also welcome Dr. Jose Kanaka, who's a board certified general psychiatrist and assistant professor here at UNM. Dr. Kanaka completed his training here at uh, the University of New Mexico. He currently serves as a, an associate program director for the general psychiatry program. Dr. Kanaka is also the director of the rural and community program. He also serves as one of the medical directors um, for ECHO in Latin America. I believe we will also have some other um, experts joining us, um, uh, potentially helping us learn a little bit more about sleep and a little bit more about psychotherapy. Um, so we can, um, Dr. Sauer, Dr. Kanaka can help me introduce them along the way. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, um, Dr. Sauer, Dr. Kanaka for starting us off. I'm going to turn the, the, the uh, banner to you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Katzman, for the introduction. And yeah, nice to see everyone again this afternoon. So we are fortunate to have this hour to talk more about um, the residency program in terms of like kind of an overview on recent um, progress or focus points and thinking about some opportunities for growth as well. Um, and as mentioned, really fortunate to have Dr. Kanaka here, who will talk more about our role in community offerings. And then um, one of our residents too, Dr. Aziz Al-Bawab, will talk about psychotherapy for a bit. And then Dr. Diaz, Shauna Diaz at the end is gonna talk a bit about sleep. So sounds like a handful of different topics, but um, try to demonstrate how they're all integrated here shortly. So let me go ahead and share my slides. Um, gotcha. All right. So as mentioned, we'll look at some highlights, updates, opportunities. We don't have any relevant financial disclosures for our presenters today. So I think most of us are pretty familiar with general aspects of the residency. Many of us have trained here or a residence here, of course, work here day to day, um, but talk about some of the new curricular and elective opportunities. Um, highlight the role in community offerings, as well as some of the um, research and child track, some of the other subspecialty offerings that we have. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little time at the end talking about our um, action plan, which was generated from the ACGME survey results last year. And it touches on some areas that I think are good opportunities for continued development or growth for us, which includes some content on sleep and fatigue, and that's where we'll transition to Dr. Diaz. Um, so I just wanted to start in gratitude. I think of the many layers of um, history and individuals that you know we have so much gratitude for as a program, um, as well as for everyone who's here. Thank you for your efforts day in, day out in making the residency what it is. Um, and for all of our staff and, you know, those who support us in this process too. So I wanted to share the program's mission statement, just kind of as framework to start. Uh, this was devised or uh, edited, you know, several times over the past few years. Um, but so we focus on outstanding education and training for our residents, thinking specifically about training physicians with a diversity 
or from a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives who will become particularly adept at serving the unique demographic and socioeconomic needs of New Mexico, as well as those of the nation and greater global community. Um, and that as a program, we encourage personal growth and development in the area of trainees specific interests, including well-rounded balance of neurobiological, epidemiological, psychological, and sociocultural aspects of psychiatry. So yeah, I think this is a lovely mission statement and um, encompasses so much of the diversity in our department. So these wound up being a little blurry, but um, have some photos of our main training sites. And just as a reminder, so um, our department's been around for, or, I'm sorry, our residency has been around for many years. I think in the 60s, we had our first class. Um, we're currently at 16 residents per class as far as the match size um, for coming classes. So our PGY two, three, and four years are slightly smaller, but our intern class has 16 residents. Um, that includes three residents uh, is the current number who match simultaneously into our child track that we'll talk more about. And again, just some focus on um, diversity in our resident class and an inclusive environment. I've listed or highlighted by picture some of the sites here. So, um, you know, our residents rotate between UNM, the VA. We do have a couple of rotations potentially expanding at uh, Sandoval and then a lot of great community and rural opportunities. And as Dr. Katzman mentioned, um, you know, we're fortunate just to have so many subspecialty areas and fellowships and our psychology internship. Um, which adds so much richness to our residency program. And um, those programs will each have more opportunity to speak about um, their offerings and uh, where they're at in the next month or so at the next Education Grand Rounds. Okay, so in terms of leadership, um, we're grateful to have Dr. Katzman as our Vice Chair of Education. And then in terms of um, support for the program, so we have a a big program and um, both in terms of what we know sustains and is necessary to keep our program growing and what's required by ACGME. Um, we do need quite a bit of FTE to support the residency. So I'm uh, fortunate to have the program director role and then have some great program directors, associate program directors. So um, listed here in alphabetical order, Dr. Caitlin Armijo, has stepped into the role as um, outpatient, particularly working with the PGY3 class and especially an outpatient clinic. Um, Dr. Jose Kanaka is our program director for the rural and community offerings. Um, Dr. Catherine Kilgore is working with our PGY2 class and also with a strong interest in more psychotherapy um, support. And then Dr. Amanda Vallone is our VA, our PGY1 especially. Um, associate program director. And then of course we couldn't do it without our program coordinators. So Andrea, Judith, Lily, and also Sean, who are the glue to making so much happen. And uh, we're just really fortunate to have their expertise and experience. So in terms of chief residents, um, I, you know, I like to honor the amount of time and effort that these individuals are investing as well in, in um, growing our program. So I've listed here by year, um, we have Dr. Norton with our PGY ones, Dr. Haynes with our twos, and then Dr. Khalil who works with the two, the second year class as well as primarily in PES. Um, Dr. Wen is our PGY three chief. And then we have um, some of the subspecialty areas mentioned here for psychotherapy, Dr. Albawab, CL, Dr. Wiley, um, and then we have a rural chief, Dr. Aurora, community, Dr. Davidson, and then we have two education co-chiefs, Dr. Aurora and Dr. Romero. Um, so I've pulled a couple pictures for today's session. This is a, a picture of our current fours, um, many of whom are now chief residents when they were interns. Yeah, so, you know, the, the chief resident roles are critical, of course, in orienting and supporting residents in all years and also helping drive more educational um, development. So just to bring us up to speed in terms of as a specialty where psychiatry sits, uh, mostly thinking in some of the numbers from recent applications. So this is from last year's application and match data, excuse me. Um, so last year there were 50% more applicants than there were training spots available. Um, the number that matched is listed here. So in total, there were 1,250 students from allopathic schools that matched, 
and 387 from osteopathic training schools. Um, there were only a total of 17 unfilled positions, so not, not many at all. Um, and when you look at the number of senior medical school graduates who selected psychiatry, it's doubled over the past decade. I'm sorry, that goes from 2011 to 2022 there. So in 2011, there were about 640 people who went into psychiatry up to 1251. Um, and the number of psychiatry programs has also expanded as demonstrated there. Um, and then, you know, I think I like to think in terms of where, you know, why we highlight psychiatry as a really meaningful career path um, for many reasons, but including the workforce shortage that we know about both here in New Mexico as well as nationally. So the bottom left graph is looking at the psychiatrist per county in um, most rural areas in the United States. Um, so the gray areas are urban counties, and then the other ones with color are, are rural. So you can see, for example, in New Mexico, we have several counties without any psychiatrists and then several with a limited number. Um, and you can see that pattern you know, throughout many places in the country. And part of why we're really fortunate to have such a great rural and community program here. Um, the bottom right is also looking at the number of psychiatrists per 100,000 people in the US. So you can see in New Mexico, we're kind of in the middle um, schema here as far as number per population. Um, and I think most of us know we're still pretty underserved in the state. And then this was, um, this is a little bit older graph, although the data remains consistent that as far as practicing child and adolescent psychiatrists, it's quite a national shortage um, in almost all states, a severe shortage. So, um, you know, I think we're very, we're proud to have a pretty big program and really continue to think about how we can um, train psychiatrists to help support our communities, both rural and urban. Okay, so in terms of some of the primary residency goals, you know, I think we really try to dedicate energy and focus to providing the best educational and clinical opportunities that we can in the core areas of psychiatric care or the core areas of training. So thinking about these primary sites of inpatient, outpatient, emergency, and consult psychiatry across all ages and demographics and backgrounds. And so some of our other um, areas to help do that are, you know, how we can strengthen our didactics, how we can strengthen the educational content for our residents, how we can think about enhancing opportunities for subspecialty development, and how we can further support, support scholarly activity, research, um, and be responsive to resident feedback and ideas. I think, you know, we have some really amazing residents and just really, um, you know, being mindful of, of where we can heed feedback from what the experience is like going through this to um, continue to mold into the best program we can. Um, so in terms of some of the formal educational opportunities through the residency, we've been moving towards developing a few more tracks. So we've had a rural track for quite a while um, and a research track that again, we're dedicating more um, investment of protected time towards for residents who are really motivated to do research as well as clinical training and then a child track as well. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for further subspecialty pursuit through the years and as our residency expands and we have a little bit more elective time for residents, I think continuing to brainstorm around the most effective ways to do this is important for us. So I'm gonna transition now to Dr. Kanaka to talk more about our role in community updates. Thanks Dr. Kanaka for being here. Thank you, Dr. Sauer. It's good to see you everyone. Let me share my screen. Um, Okay. I'm assuming you can see it, right? Because how can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Looks great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to see you. And thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to share with the residents and faculty and other members of the community what we have to offer to our students, our learners, and the communities. So we have this amazing program, the rural program, and it is possible because of the generous contribution from the human services department. Without them, we, we wouldn't have this program right now. So thank you to all of them. 
And I'm just one member of the rural team. So as you can see, this is our team and we meet like every other week and we plan uh, experiences for the residents and, and we get feedback for, from our communities to develop and to support them. So this is a big group. So when, when we talk about rural, I hope you know that you have a lot of people working for you. So thank you, thank you everyone. And, and before I share with you the opportunities that we have for our learners, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone about UNM's mission. And the mission is that every single person living in New Mexico will have access to the highest quality healthcare. So, and we take that seriously and we do it in many ways, right? One of them is through the rural program. So with that grant, with the money that we get from the state, we're able to send uh, our residents anywhere in New Mexico, right? With that money, we cover housing, transportation, per being. So it, it is a win-win situation. Our residents learn from the communities, right? It's a, it's a, a, a unique experience when they join the rural program. And at the same time, we're fulfilling UNM's mission, right? Providing quality care to every single person living in New Mexico. So these are, I just highlighted some of the very active sites and you can see Las Vegas, New Mexico, Gallup, Zuni Pueblo, and Ridoso. But we have agreements with other places, just like Las Cruces and Alamogordo. And if any of the residents come uh, to us and, and ask like, can I do something in Raton or Melrose, New Mexico? We develop that rotation for them. So this is just, uh, just to give you an example of what we have available right now, but that doesn't mean that those are the only places that we can work with. Zuni Pueblo is one of the most popular sites right now. Every single year we send two or three residents to Zuni and they work with Dr. Uh, Joy McQuarrie. She connects from Colorado and, and the residents see patients uh, in the outpatient clinic and they connect with Dr. McQuarrie as well. Some of the residents also uh, go and teach to uh, elementary school students or, or middle schoolers. So this is a, a really active place and really every single day we have three residents at least asking to go to Zuni Pueblo. We also send residents to Mescalero and the Ridoso area. And when they go there, they also work at the outpatient clinic, right? And, and they have three supervisors if they go there to Mescalero. Dr. Bonham is one of them, Dr. Whitebird Orange is another one, and myself. So they see patients there, or they can also see patients at the school-based health center in Ridoso, right? So Mescalero is a Native American community, Ridoso it is not, but they, they're very close to each other and people move from one place to the other, right? So residents have the experience with the Native American community and with the Ridoso community. We also have this partnership with the state hospital, right? For the last few years, we've been able to send residents to the forensic unit under the supervision of Dr. Paul Bagwell. But uh, this year, we also added the inpatient opportunity for the residents. So, for the residents connected right now, if you wanna to go to Las Vegas, you're gonna have those two options, right? You can do both, you can do one of them, and, and, and this is available for you right now. This is not quite rural. One whole clinic is here in Albuquerque, but that's a very unique clinic. It is located in the international district, and it served that, uh, special community, right? Mostly recent immigrants. So these uh, recent immigrants, mostly from Latin America, right? Mexico, Central America, they come to this clinic. And we've been there since 2017. So this is something that the PGY force can do as an elective, right? For the, 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 the senior year. So they usually how it works is they go once a week to the clinic, maybe just one half day, and they see patients in the outpatient setting. They can also work with the family medicine program 
And, and this is something they work as the experts, right? Because we, you have medical students going to that clinic, family medicine doctors, and faculty from the family department. So our PGY4 is the expert, and they can do uh, a lot to improve the health of that community. So this year, Dr. Ugo Rueda is going to be the one working uh, at one whole clinic. Those are like the, the community experience that we have, right? Kind of like the, the long term or like for a month. We also provide the crisis intervention for the communities in need. And I can see Dr. Mishra connected there, right? And you see the picture, that's Dr. Mishra and Dr. Nakir. So just to give you a little bit of background, a few months ago, Gallup had uh, its parade, right? Because of the pandemic, they didn't have the parade for two or three years. Uh, an event happened. Some of the community members got injured by someone, nobody died. And, and they came to UNM and asked if we could help their community, right? The police department, uh, fire department, schools, uh, even court, or the general population. And, and we sent this email, right, to the department, to the residents asking that, is anybody interested in coming to Gallup and provide some support to, to the community? We had a lot of residents asking like, can I go? Can I go there? I'm, I'm ready to do it. Dr. Misha and I were one of the, the first one asking to please, I need to do something for that community. So thank you very much to both of you. Dr. Martin also went to that community. Dr. Penrose and Andrade said, I want to go, but because of some logistics, they were not able to do it, but they were ready to do it. And you can see some of the faculty members were also able to provide some help. And this was done through the rural uh, program. So thank you, everyone, that uh, helped that community in need. Thank you very much. So that's what we do with this grant from the state, right? This is New Mexico. Those are the opportunities for our residents to serve those communities. But we have some international opportunities as well. So one of them is New Zealand. Before the pandemic, we were very active with them. We used to send PGY4s for six months to New Zealand, but then the pandemic came and something happened. But we're having conversations with them again. It seems promising we believe that we're gonna be able to send uh, residents to New Zealand this coming year, 2023. And maybe you can ask like, why New Zealand? There is a lot of uh, things that we share with New Zealand. One of them is the, the high number of indigenous population in both places, right? And, and they feel very comfortable with the training that our residents receive in New Mexico. So uh, PGY4, get ready. I, I hope we're gonna be sending emails saying that we're gonna resume this opportunity for you guys. Uh, ECHO is expanding its services to Latin America. And, and this is something led by Dr. Katzman, Dr. Toyn and myself. So we're gonna have our own programs with some places in Latin America. I think I'm gonna start my, uh, my program with Central America and Dominican Republic in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna bring residents. This, this is something that we're trying to develop as a rotation for the residents as well. Ah, almost done, uh, just a couple more. One, this is an amazing opportunity. Uh, a little bit of background before the pandemic, Guam used to have five psychiatrists working in the island. Pandemic came, they only have one psychiatrist right now, a child psychiatrist. They need some help, that's a US territory. So what happened was it's like, okay, we have this population, half of the population in Guam is indigenous population. They thought about UNM and they approached Dr. Silverblatt and Dr. Sauer and they're asking if there's any way that we can collaborate. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago and everything went well. Uh, we're just drafting the, the agreement right now and it sounds like, everything is moving forward nicely. And, and our goal is to have everything ready by January, 2023. So we're talking about just three or four months. If we do that, 
we're going to be able to send PGY force to one for six months. Uh, so this is going to be another opportunity for you guys. Get ready. And this is my last one, Dr. Sauer. Uh, Dr. Al Schul, she is one of the leaders at CBH with Dr. Bonham. They're in charge of that division. UNM, as an institution, I'm not talking about the psych department, is trying to expand this inter intercultural exchange right, with other countries. And Dr. also got a, a little tiny stipend, a grant to explore this uh, possibility of doing something with Spain. She already went to Spain and she had a meeting with people uh, in, from Madrid, uh, I believe uh, Malaga in Santander, and they're excited to do something with UNM. So we're moving to the next step. If everything goes well, we're gonna be able to send six uh, learners to Spain, and this is gonna be by March or April of 2023. And that includes psychology students, pre and postdoctoral students, and residents. So a lot of opportunities for you guys, and, and you know, my door is always open. If you have any questions, just let me know, and, and, and I'm very grateful for the rural team. So thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Sawa. Thank you, Dr. Kanaka. Yeah, I love the slideshow. Lots of great pictures and really, I think just some great exciting opportunities in terms of electives, both shorter term and longer term for residents through the year. So thank you so much for your leadership. Let me go back to a few slides on my slideshow next. Um, so we also wanted to uh, highlight a couple of the other tracks as mentioned. So we talked about the rural program and the residents have the opportunity to be a part of the rural track starting early on in residency. Um, so I will touch base on research next and um, you know that I'll, I'll do my best to do, do justice to these. Um, some of our leaders in these different fields weren't able to join today. But um, so in terms of research, you know, I think as a priority and, and something that we want to invest in through the department with Dr. Toen's support um, through various layers, we have, you know, multiple opportunities. I wanted to talk about the research track. Um, so this is an offering for people starting in their PGY2 year where, you know, if, the, if an individual feels pretty committed to doing research and is hopeful to have additional protected space during residency for this um, and likely transitioning into a career that they're doing a mix of clinician scientist work, um, the research track could be a good fit for them. So we currently have two positions available in terms of funding. And so how it looks is ideally during the first year or towards the end of internship, um, residents applying and meeting with Dr. Crisanti and other members of the research team to decide if it's a good fit. Um, and then in terms of time, so there is a PGY2 selective currently. It's a month that uh, may grow into more time in subsequent years, again, as the residency expands that could be dedicated to research time specifically. The PGY3 year, traditionally, we've had some requirements around um, how that elective time is spent as far as location and, and clinical components. But for the research track individuals, that can all be research. And then certainly we have hopes about the amount of time during their PGY4 year that they would dedicate. Um, some of the other offerings for residents in terms of research. So we have our, our uh, historically strong PGY3 research elective that happens in the first few months of PGY3 year. And then ongoing journal clubs and um, mentorship hopefully other opportunities to support residents in doing and presenting research in other venues too. Um, the child track I'll talk a little bit about. So this was started a few years ago when Dr. Sidhu was here in part to bring um, more residents into child early on and to reduce sort of the necessity of doing another round of applications um, in the midst of residency for fellowship. So as it stands, our child track has about three, two to three positions annually. Um, and what this translates into is a separate match for residents. So when, they, when a student decides to apply for our residency, they can apply for the general residency or the child track or both. Um, and if they match into the child track, then basically that means a guaranteed fellowship position. So it's usually the three years of general residency plus the fellowship. 
And again, goal of increasing interest in child psychiatry, as well as providing people on the track with more um, exposure to pediatrics and child psychiatry in their first couple years of training. Um, so yeah, I think another exciting offering to booster the number of child psychiatrists, especially locally. Um, just another minute here to honor DEI efforts within our program and department. So we're really grateful to have Dr. Smart's leadership, both within the department and HSC. Um, so for residents, there has been, um, Dr. Haynes has also been um, leading this with Dr. Smart, but expanding our curriculum as part of didactics, touching on various DEI related content. Um, there is a DEI committee available for residents, and GME is also starting a new JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, and so just really thinking about this in terms of recruitment, retention, as we're coming up to new uh, recruitment season two. Um, and then we're fortunate, the Learning Environment Office, which is really dedicated towards helping improve education and psychological safety in our learning environments, um, I think we may have a grand rounds from them later this year, but just again, touching base on uh, the importance of the health of our learning environment. Um, and then a couple more areas I just wanted to highlight in terms of curricular shifts. I know I'm not getting a chance to highlight all of our areas, certainly within addictions and CL and integrative medicine. We have so many different subspecialties. So very much appreciate um, everyone's efforts in those. And again, we can talk more at some of our subsequent grand rounds, but with neuromodulation, you know, as a program, we're exceptionally strong um, nationally, in part thanks to our neuromodulation faculty. So this past year, there was a new PGY2 um, rotation that was created uh, in part with Dr. Miller's leadership. So it's a mix of geriatrics plus ECT so that all um, PGY2 residents have the chance to be more embedded into ECT offerings. Um, there's many elective trainings still within ECT, um, ketamine, TMS, and that's both at UNM and the VA, and then additional research opportunities too. Um, so psychotherapy, which definitely been, has been an important core of our residency in many um, thanks to Dr. Katzman with this. We just wanted to provide a couple highlights. So Dr. Al-Gawab, who's here and is our psychotherapy chief, I'll hand it to you to share a few updates about psychotherapy. Sure. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Aziz, the therapy chief, like Dr. Sauer mentioned, and just briefly talk about uh, psychotherapy experience for residents and what that's like and um, also what supervisors could expect. Um, so, so basically the first experience that residents have with psychotherapy is in their second year. They're expected to have their first patient and they're working supportively at that point. So it's mostly just supportive psychotherapy with some didactics about um, attachment theory, about psychodynamic therapy and, and a host of things. And then in their second year, um, so, that, so that's, that's the second year, that's the PGY2 year. And then when they move to the third year, that's typically where residents get the bulk of their therapy experience. So um, CBT as well as psychodynamic, and they have almost year long didactics in both of those modalities in CBT and, and in psychodynamic therapy. Um, in their fourth year, they still do both CBT and psychodynamic with an emphasis in one of them. And they have the option of pursuing uh, further therapy and electives across different um, contexts that you can reach out to me if you want to learn more about that. Uh, in terms of su supervision, so the PGY3s have supervisors for CBT and for psychodynamic therapy. Um, and we're super thankful to everyone who volunteered to supervise and I'll be reaching out to you soon. In terms of uh, supervisors for the second years, we're still in the process of assigning supervisors to them. And we've had uh, historically uh, some problems in finding volunteers for everyone. So if you're considering volunteering, we would be super appreciative. Please do let me know. In terms of what to expect uh, for supervisors. So ideally, the meeting would take place regularly, like weekly, uh, but this can definitely fluctuate. It can be on a less frequent basis. There have been some attendings who have met with their supervisees in groups. So if um, I know Dr. Katzman is meeting with two of the PGY2s in a, in a group kind of uh, format and 
that could be that could be more time efficient. It could also allow for residents to learn from each other's cases. Certainly, something you can um, explore. Um, and what else? And I and I've I've sent out a document last week that you can refer to. It has some information about um, what supervision is like. And um, if anyone has any questions or anything about any any concerns about psychotherapy, whatever it is, please feel free to reach out. Dr. Aldoa, thank you for your dedication to psychotherapy. I know this is a voluntary um, chiefing role that you've really invested so much energy in for us. So thanks for being present today. And as mentioned, yeah, we're certainly happy to have more faculty join us um, in a supervisory role too. So um, let me jump back to a little bit more content. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have a great depth of clinical opportunities that we've talked about. And I think our didactics, as for many programs through the pandemic, moving virtual had its conveniences and certainly um, importance health-wise, but I think also has, you know, come with some challenges and shifted um, the learning environment and experience. So we are back in person this year and uh, definitely have appreciated the our residents' flexibility in adapting to being back and having some hybrid experiences still. Um, so a few kind of directions that we're heading with didactics are shifting to more of a block structure where we have dedicated blocks. So for example, mood disorders, psychotic disorders, neuropsychiatry, et cetera, through the four years that have a course lead and so in turn some continuity through the years. Um, hopefully to help with organization and flow in the didactics. And we've integrated a few more inter-class opportunities. So we have the residency houses this year, which gives an opportunity for residents to be together with people from other classes and with faculty mentorship to talk about some pretty important topics and training, and then also special interest groups to give them a little, uh, to give a little extra time um, again, to pursue or begin brainstorming about areas of interest. Um, and then journal club, numeracy, some other standing interclass opportunities we've had. We recognize that we've had some deficits in terms of um, storage of content, you know, so a place that people can access content easily from lectures or just have more kind of organizational workflow to didactics. So, so that's something we're very actively working on. We're grateful to have a didactic work group that meets weekly and is really trying to target, um, you know, improving and uh, just brainstorming ways to evolve our curriculum too. So in terms of some additional growth opportunities, I think we've reviewed this in uh, certainly with our residents and also our faculty meeting, but just to highlight again from our ACGME survey last year, and then in turn what we've transitioned into an action plan, there's a few areas that specifically we wanted to focus on. So one was feedback about concern about safety in certain environments, um, safety of working conditions, um, and wanting to make it psychologically safe environments for learning. Um, and then having the balance between education and clinical time um, for people to feel like they're receiving adequate and uh, timely feedback, and then having a space for confidential reporting of concerns um, for us to you know, be mindful about where people are uh, kind of losing time or energy for non-physician obligations or things that might be able to be done by people who are not physicians. Um, and then talking about sleep mitigation. So there's a lot of content here. Um, I won't really go into depth. I just wanted to share that in turn, you know, we do have a couple active committees. So our program evaluation committee that meets monthly is, um, we have many residents, several residents from each class as representatives here. And this is a, a great workspace for us to talk about some of the challenges that have come up within the program um, and to think about solutions. And then our resident clinical competency committee that's faculty based faculty led by Dr. Frazier that meets every other week and is looking at how our residents are doing and really trying to support people who um, may be encountering challenges uh, or you know, to think also about the evolution and progression um, of resident knowledge during their training. Um, so based on that, um, survey kind of in coordination with feedback from some of these working groups. We have made some shifts 
we're fortunate that Dr. Quinn with his um, position in the MHC and with safety and quality um, has been involved in providing more recent updates and also his monthly safety and quality related meeting. Um, Dr. Tarani has been very involved in helping support feedback initiatives. Um, and we had the couple grand rounds about those earlier this year. And then again, just thinking about, you know, where we have space to um, support our program. If you're involved with committees or task force or quality improvement projects that um, are relevant or that you think would be helpful to include residents in, you know, please certainly let us know too. We're always wanting to expand that. Um, and I just have one or two slides and then I'll go to Dr. Diaz. So the last thing is just utilizing this format a bit as a couple reminders. So one is that um, I know we all have many things on our plate and often a lot of emails. So you may see these new innovation evaluation reminders. They are really critical. The evaluations that we get from faculty and from residents about their training experiences that come via new innovations are really important to us, um, especially as we're evaluating um, how people are doing feedback, and then thinking about progression for our residents through the years. So we just ask that when you can, as you can, please be completing those for your rotations. Um, all of our residents have CSV, the um, clinical skills exams that are required one per year as part of their graduation requirement. And so we appreciate our faculty support too and helping get these done. And then there are the many required trainings and documentations that uh, we just try to keep up with. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities. You know, we have new electives as mentioned in part by Dr. Kanaka and other local um, UNM based electives. I think more opportunities for mentorship. We may be shifting some of our schedules as our class sizes expands, for example, in PES, still working on that as a final plan. But um, yeah, just a lot of areas of growth and our recruitment season will start here pretty soon. We're gonna start at the end of October. We'll have a kickoff in early October to talk about the year and um, meet with faculty and residents. So thanks again to everyone for your time there. Um, so I will hand here for the last few minutes to Dr. Diaz, Shanna Diaz, who is our sleep medicine expert and fellowship director. Um, we, last year we did receive some feedback from the ACGME survey that we um, could use some more support in talking about sleep and fatigue. Um, sleep deprivation and in a way that's maybe not just about our patient care, but more so for us. So I'll turn to Dr. Diaz for the last part of this talk um, for her expertise. Thanks, Dr. Diaz. Awesome. Thanks, Christina, Dr. Sauer. Hi, everybody. It's nice to uh, see the psychiatric crowd and I will not take too long, but I'm going to try my best to share the right screen. So give me, give me one second. Um, I know this is going to be the wrong screen when I switch it, and then I'm going to switch it again, and it'll work. So I apologize that I still. Okay, are you seeing the big screen or the the one that has the wrong thing on it? Uh, the actual we're slideshow. Seeing, we're seeing your slideshow, uh, but also with the okay the big screen with the little like you might want to push slide, the slideshow. At the Yes, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to switch screens, which means I'm going to be looking off to the side of you for a bit. I apologize. Okay. Um, I want you to sleep on it. So I know we hear so much about burnout and what to do about it. Um, and it's been studied for years and years, this idea of how important sleep is. And yet every time I talk about sleep, I feel a little pinch of guilt about how I need to focus on it more too, and how much I wish I knew as much as I do now in my training to have prioritized sleep more. I should have not gone to the gym. I should have been sleeping instead. I should have been lazy and sleeping in instead of being sleep deprived to go work out. You should do both, but if you have to pick one, you should sleep enough. Um, because uh, this actually, you'll notice um, this, this sums up this idea of how important sleep is in terms of not just our impairments um, in work, but but how much it can affect how burned out we feel, how we don't feel um, fulfilled, and never mind medical errors and things. Um, and there are so many focuses on how do we help burnout, and we talk about things we can do personally, but we know that it's also hugely systems-based. But if there's one thing that we can do selfishly individually for ourselves is if we get enough sleep for ourselves, then it's a lot easier to deal with the big things that we can't change, that we can't change the system overnight, that we can't change our medical record, 
our medical documentation or other things, but we can try and change um, how much sleep we get because it really can make it a lot easier to uh, survive ourselves. So can we adapt to sleep loss? Does anyone think you can actually adapt to sleep loss? Like get used to it. Uh, can we do as well? Oops, I'm sorry if I probably wasn't showing that slide about burnout that was right here. My apologies. I realize, see there's Dr. Lawrence um, on this recent JAMA article about what I was just pitching. Um, we cannot actually adapt to sleep loss. We think we can. We feel like we get used to it. Um, but if you were comparing somebody who had slept enough to themselves not slept, um, any performance can get better with practice, but it will never be as good as it would be if you were practicing and also sleeping enough. So there's been many and many a study and these kind of bullets here just captured the idea about how much we don't realize that we're not doing as well. Um, so our objective measures of sleepiness do not match our self-awareness. Our frontal uh, parts of our brain that are sleep deprived are the ones that are supposed to recognize um, have insight to that and they're sleep deprived, so they don't. So for example, anesthesia residents couldn't even tell that they had fallen asleep over half the time. Um, if we watch them on sleep studies, we can watch their brain waves confirm they are officially asleep um, and they don't identify that they've slept. Um, and there is always in almost every study that's ever been done that we overestimate our levels of alertness um, and underestimate how sleepy we are, especially in medicine when we're taught to just kind of like, we need to push through. We need to make sure we don't um, miss things. And so that that vigilance and, and being good at um, getting things done makes it harder for us to see that we're tired. Um, and that uh, lack of accuracy makes it harder to identify our impairment. And it's not just, um, oh, I never stay up. I don't pull all-nighters anymore. But if we look at somebody who's um, sleeping less than seven hours, like over a week, which that has absolutely happened to me, um, we're not as good at, at doing things objectively, um, no matter how we test it. So just to sell, it really does matter. We don't, we don't get over it. What this does to us personally is increases the chance that we're going to have problems in our personal and professional lives. It's really hard to have a good attitude um, when you're not well slept the chance that you're gonna gain weight is higher. People who are sleeping less than six hours on average are gonna eat 500 calories more a day, not even realizing it because your brain just wants sugar. Um, it's much harder to be uh, motivated. There's a higher likelihood of conflict, more alcohol use, more stimulant use, um, higher risk of mood and memory problems. And that's hard because we're carrying a lot of weight of our patients, of our colleagues and um, it can be easy to miss how high a risk we are um, of, of having these vulnerabilities just because of not sleeping well. There are some people who are more vulnerable to the effects of sleep deprivation than others. So some people might be thinking, no, I, I actually do pretty well. I can function pretty well on four hours and I can't call you a liar. It's true. Um, there are night owls and morning larks and everybody who falls in between. Um, but night owls, if you find like, yes, I do better later, I feel fresher in the evenings, um, I get my best work done, um, they're going to have an easier time adapting to night shift, they're going to have an easier time becoming sleep deprived, compared to a morning lark, someone who's early to bed, early to rise, um, harder to cope with sleep loss. So the difference of you get called in the middle of the night, and you pop up, and yes, what is it, I'll take care of that versus wait, can you say that again? What did you say? How much was he on? Can you repeat that? Um, it's not, don't think those lucky night owls, the night owls, because they are more prone to ripping themselves off of sleep, also have higher cardiovascular risk, higher risk of mood disorders, higher risk of su uh, suicide, substance use problems. Um, it comes at a cost. Um, it's carcinogenic to not sleep enough. So um, we shouldn't be all that grateful for being good at getting by um, with sleep deprivation. Uh, so it's, it's helpful to, to kind of know where you fall on that list and know that there's pros and cons of being a morning lark or a night owl. And this is genetically driven. So your sleep needs are genetically driven. Um, so my husband needs almost 11 hours of sleep, which of course he will never get because <laughs> how, how, how could I stop the resentment from that and, and our house functioning? So he will chronically be sleep deprived and I have a very hard time sleeping more than seven and a half hours. It's like seven hours and 15 minutes to seven and a half hours, no matter how I cut it. So 
Um, these sound like no duh, and there's lots of reasons that we could have these symptoms, but um, some warning signs to notice in ourselves and others about fatigue are um, just feeling like your head is like heavier or a dull headache. Um, I cannot count the number of times that I would walk around um, on the back when I'm in patient psych with one of the blankets. I mean, look, there's still one over my chair. In fact, there's two over chairs back there, embarrassingly, because I'm here at night, I get cold and I have the blanket on. And it's like my brain like is guiltily thinking that you're getting the blanket out. That means you're tired. Um, so if you're wanting to grab a blanket when you're working, um, feeling restless, not caring as much, um, just having to repeatedly check your work and wonder, did I finish that code note? Was there some other sentence? Getting distracted um, and food choices. Um, I ate chili cheese fries in the morning like they were amazing from the cafeteria and I still think they're amazing. So careful, um, but they, they, you are much more likely to eat um, things that aren't good for you and then you don't do as well. And if you're looking for problems in others, just watching for lots of yawning, uh, a more flattened affect or less speech. Um, on the other hand, the more speech, the disinhibited. So somebody who's usually not talkative if saying things they usually wouldn't, or someone like me who talks all the time is suddenly quiet and not talking much, something that's out of character, um, kind of showing up late, even if it's just a few minutes, little by little, and seeming slowed in things. So these are, um, there's many reasons to feel this, but instead of passing it off as, oh, they're just stressed or, um, you know, that it's depression or feeling overwhelmed, uh, something to keep in mind. So if we look at, okay, what about data of why am I saying this? There was a large multi-specialty survey done quite some time ago. I mean, this is, this is an older uh, study, but it, it still holds true that if you look at this uh, residents' ratings of their, their training, and we see uh, over time the reported average daily sleep, so less than four hours and then all the way up to seven to eight hours. And we see uh, the blue line is learning and that's going up. And then the, the lines of feeling belittled or humiliated, feeling like you have some sort of impairment um, and your levels of stress all go down the more uh, sleep that residents are getting. So as faculty, we should be encouraging um, and trying to um, ourselves make sure we're getting enough sleep and we're encouraging that in our residents instead of this kind of old school. We're called house officers because we live in house and we are there at beck and call and we don't need sleep because we have trained to do this. And we know that's necessary sometimes, but satisfaction with residency increases stress better um, and that overall um, the residency experience is better. So we should all be. Um, trying to get enough sleep to have a better a better learning experience and a better experience as faculty feeling like we're being effective in supporting our residents. Um, if you just tell them to go to sleep, they'll like you more. It's very cool. Um, so what we can do for reducing fatigue related errors and quality of patient care, that's, I, I should have renamed the slide to say like also to feel supported and to help us um, as, as learners and as faculty is working in teams and having a culture of support about taking fatigue and sleepiness seriously and not thinking of it as a weakness. Um, particularly if we know that we're more prone to having um, problems with, with sleep deprivation or for example, a morning lark, if they are woken up out of sleep, they might need like five to 15 minutes to snap out of it and not seem like they cannot understand what you're saying because they, they have what's called sleep inertia. Their brain's really good at marinating in sleep chemicals um, and it takes a little while for them to get back in their homes and that that should be normalized instead of pathologized. Um, it would be amazing if there was almost like an opt out of taking a break instead of like, hey, let me know if you have a problem, but being able to kind of, hey, um, have you had a break? Can you, do you want to go take a, a nap? Do you need a few minutes to rest? Um, to expect that, because uh, I know as a learner, it, I don't know if I ever would have had the guts to say, I can't think straight because I'm so tired. Can I go to bed while I'm watching my attending work? I, I don't know if I could have done it. I, I might not have been mature enough to do that. Um, but we should know who those around us, our culture of support should know who has been on call or will be on call um, in terms of like tiger text going out and spamming back and forth, um, trying to keep our work environment good, bright lighting, cool temperature, 
good ventilation, um, and knowing our, our residents and learners, knowing who they can go to if they are having um, a struggle with fatigue or sleep, whether like acutely or, you know, over time of like, I can't, uh, I'm having a hard time getting enough sleep for one reason or the other. Um, there are so many other things to go over and specific details that I'm just throwing out there. I would be happy to get feedback either directly or, you know, collected by someone in psychiatry of specific things that you would like to know more about for sleep for yourselves or strategies of how to get better sleep or catch up sleep or caffeine timing, nap timing, anything that would be helpful um, in whatever venue would work. I would be happy to, um, to partake in. And I think that's it. And I'm happy to take any question if anyone has any question. Thanks, Dr. Diaz. Yeah, thank you so much. We talked about having you back at another, another opportunity to, to go more in depth with some of these strategies, but um, great. Well, I think that's it. I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Katzman, for any closing on the session. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for really an inspired presentation, Dr. Sauer, what you're doing with the training program is just um, so, so remarkable and, and appreciated by all of us uh, and to the whole team. Um, just uh, much, much gratitude for, for all of you and what you're doing.